Welcome to the herd and thanks for listening. If you enjoy this sodcast, please like it, share it, give it a good rating and follow, and help more people find their way into the Ruminati herd. If you have suggestions for improvements, please let me know. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Meet Your Herdmates Sodcast. I'm very pleased today to be joined by Ray Archuleta, the soil guy, um, who I had the pleasure of meeting and learning from starting several years ago. And we've just been catching up because it's been a couple years since we saw each other, been a few changes. Um, but you were you were one of the first people that I became aware of, and this is several years ago, uh, right after I came back to agriculture. By the way, when I came back to agriculture, I saw BMR in the seed catalogs, and I thought that was some virus that I had. <laughs> so I had to go look it up and go, oh yeah, I've missed a few things in the few years I've been gone. Um, but when I came back, there was just this beginning, at least to my perception, of cover cropping, and I became aware of no-tilling, and I became aware of soil health, and you were somebody that was talking to audiences in that, those subject matters. So, um, welcome. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. Yes, I, I remember you very vividly. You, you still have that same young, vibrant smile from the first time I met, and then also that very inquisitive mind and, and that aha moment. And I think probably you, you've been exposed to a lot of, um, I call it holistic thought process where you see the big picture. And, and sometimes that's been a big struggle with my academic career is about looking at things in a very truncated manner. And, and I think that's where um, I think that was some of my aha moments, and I, I'll share with the group about how I, I had my epiphanies or a, a paradigm shift, and that's how I got into more of an ecologically focused agriculture. So, uh, wonderful! Glad to be here, Peter. Yeah, it's it's um, it's a pleasure. It's one of the great pleasures of doing this is I get to visit with people that I really enjoy. The mental stimulation. Um, you started out in livestock. That was your training. Uh, yeah, is that was, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Um, when uh, I, I attended a community college and, and I got my associates in in um, livestock science from Northern Community College, and then later I I graduated from there and then joined the Peace Corps for a couple of years and was a livestock specialist. Did a lot of veterinarian work. Uh, they called you the, the doctor, but I wasn't a doctor, but you know, you gave vaccines and worked with people in Guatemala and Costa Rica, and then came back and then got my degree in agricultural biology and then went to graduate school for soils. And um, yeah, so I, I got into NRCS, but I did start off my career in livestock science. So that's, it's an interesting turnaround now. Uh, from that, now I, I ranch in, in uh, mm -hmm. Seymour, Missouri, so it's kind of a full circle. And so, uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, yeah, I did start up with livestock. Yeah. So what got you from livestock to soils? That's a good question. I tell you, it started really, um, <laughs> I was one of those uh, older students and that I um, went to college later. And so I, I was all over the board because I really liked a lot of the different types of sciences from, I jumped from waste management to soils to um, agriculture biology, which is an entomology degree. So I had a little bit of, a little bit of both. I, I wanted a, a diverse mixture of education and it, it being known to me, I realized how important that is. That's how I got into soils, but what really was the epiphany, and I'll say this real quick, Peter, was I was telling you that I was working as a district conservationist. I put 32 years in the government, but I was working as a district conservationist in Ontario, Oregon. And what really got me into soils, I started realizing back then that farmers were really not making it. They were 
were going broke and the water wasn't getting clean. And we were spending millions and millions of dollars, billions, if you look at the agency as a whole, NRCS used to be called Soil Conservation Service. They could not bring their sons into the operation. And they really weren't making that much money after working so hard and having great prime agriculture areas, lots of water, like in the Treasure Valley in Idaho. And we were having massive erosion and we were having... Every time irrigation season came on, the, the, the Snake River would turn into chocolate. And I was starting to ponder, what, well, what's going on? And then I started realizing there's something, there's something really, really wrong. And I think it was when I moved from there to North Carolina, the epiphany, the light came on. It was at Gabe Brown's Ranch in 2007. When I first met Gabe, it was that fall. And I was, you know, keep in mind, Peter, it's like all of us, we go through these journeys and there's this aha moment. It's kind of like picking crumbs and walking down this journey. And then you finally reach, reach an epiphany. And I think for me, that journey of watching immense failure uh, and watching young people not being able to come to the farm and just not fixing things. And it just bugged me to no end. But that 2007 and reading Alan Savory's book finally got me to realize, oh my gosh, I missed it. It was really about the microbes. It was always about the soil microbes because when I left college, um, I looked at soil as a, as a chemistry set. Even though I took graduate level soil microbiology, graduate level soil chemistry, but I looked at the, the soil like this matrix of mineralogy and for some reason, I thought the nutrients really worked. Uh, the nutrient release was really based on the water coming in contact. And it was kind of uh, having diffusion, diffusion and diffusing the, the, the minerals elements out of the rock. And, it, and then the, and, it, and they would go into mass flow in the water solution. And then they would be intercepted by, by the roots. And I'm going, it's like, mechanical very mechanicistic mm -hmm. very chemistry and i was like oh my gosh no it was absolutely wrong and that was a journey so that's how it started for me peter i just kind of started looking at things and questioning things but that's how that journey started for me and and working in going from eastern oregon western idaho going from that relatively young agricultural area yeah to North Carolina, yeah. where they've had a hundred years plus or minus additional yeah. um, farming on that same ground. And a lot of that was spent in very much of, um, well, starts with slash and burn and, and mm -hmm. farm it until it gives out and then move on. I mean, they didn't know what we knew in the 60s or 70s, let alone what we know today. And so a lot of erosion, a lot of longer term degradation to those areas. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, I finally, you know, I came to the point, Peter, I realized that agriculture was based on the wrong premise. It was never based on the premise on relationship that the inner wisdom was to emulate the natural ecosystem, to emulate its structure, its architecture, its elegance, follow its principles, follow its pa uh, uh, patterns. I wasn't taught that in college. Mm -hmm. I wasn't taught to look at things in holes. Mm -hmm. I was taught to be prescriptive, re uh, reductive in my analysis. Uh, I also was taught yield, yield, yield. And the natural systems out there to uh, take me over. It, it was my enemy. It wasn't my, uh, it wasn't based on relationship. It was about me controlling, forcing, manipulating with my tools, tillage, fertilizers, chemicals. It was very prescriptive. That's what I took away from eight years of university study. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's, there's that sweep of things, and at the same time, you can look and kind of understand how we got to where we are. Mm -hmm. 
So one of my challenges is to get past the sort of simplifying the argument and us and them either or kind of thing because nobody benefits from that. We, we exist, we, we can look, hopefully we can look and learn from history. Hopefully we can uh, apply lessons. It, it's clear that um, there are some, so if you were to compare farming as even the top farmers in the 60s mm -hmm. to what you would see as the farmers you work with today, there are some key things that are available today that weren't available then. Yes. Uh, yeah. Beyond That's just the knowledge and awareness. So what, what might some of those things be for people? And, and again, most people listening might not even be all that familiar with no. agricultural practices. Uh, Peter, that's a, I mean, that's a really thoughtful question. I really appreciate that. I think that uh, I saw a common pattern. Uh, let, let me back up just a second, just before I answer that, Peter. I think I, I saw a common thing. If, if you go back, oh, let me back up a second. Let me make this statement. I don't know if you've ever read uh, uh, Jared Diamond's book called Collapse. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you, if you watch that, I mean, if you read that book and watch the documentary, I definitely recommend it for everybody to watch it. And what really stuck out in that book for me, that and, and so because I want to answer your question, but I want to set this framework before I answer it, that what really stuck out in that documentary, that it didn't really matter about race or um, if it was tribal people, if it was European people, if it was, it didn't matter what people on the globe, there was a common pattern. They over, uh, they abused the local resource because they overextended themselves. They were not conscious of their ecological context. And, and so there was no relationship. And, and the reason I'm saying that, that's the same thing I see occurring now. And then what happens with certain producers that stick out more than others, there is a one, an epiphany had to occur, a real epiphany. Every producer like Dave Brown or any of my uh, close associate friends that completely shifted, something wasn't working. They were questioning. There's something that happened like me, something, um, there was this rude awakening, this paradigm shift. And then it, you started looking outside yourself for the question, for the answer. And, and sometimes it takes you to back up into a corner and saying something's wrong. A majority of the producers that I, that I came across that really separates the other producers, they started asking this very probing question, start looking outside themselves. And they were noticing, they were observing that something wasn't right. And that's a common pattern that I see is one, most producers went through an epiphany. They things weren't working. They were questioning. They were they were open. And um, and that's why I, the people I reached, the upper one or ten percent, is they were open. They started looking, they had a paradigm shift, but also there they also had a um, a really intent to really bring healing and they and they tend to be very giving about their knowledge and they want to share those are some of the common patterns that I saw among these producers um, that completely shifted their operation and some of them now Peter don't even use no chemicals at all and are very financially successful but it always took an inward, a shift, paradigm shift in their in, in their no thought process. That's a, a common pattern I've seen in most of them. Mm. So, so how long ago was it that you moved roughly to to North Carolina? It was I moved to North Carolina in two thousand and five. Okay, so I okay. I stayed there ten years. I was uh, ten years so, in North Carolina. Yeah. And that would have been seven years or so before I could have run into you because yeah. I started back in agriculture in 2011. 
Um, so the I know that the and and NRCS stands for Natural Resources Conservation Service, and it's a is it a department of the USDA? Is that an accurate description? Yes, it's. It used to be called Soil Conservation Service, and the first name it was called the Soil Erosion Service. It was created in the 1935 for the purpose of uh, stopping erosion mm -hmm. and and the degradation of our soils because it was so bad that you hear the stories that huge plumes of soil from Oklahoma and the Midwest and the Plain States would be blown right into DC. I mean, it got to a point that it was a national uh, catastrophic events were happening. Mm -hmm. And very similar to the day, and then sadly it's saying, this is still occurring. Mm -hmm. This is still occurring. We're having huge dust storms still occurring in this country. Well, and overseas as well. I yes, mean, yes. Um, yes. And, and so there have been some estimates of the... Um, the impending disaster of loss of agri well the ongoing disaster of loss of agricultural soils huh. um and i i i mentioned um one estimate from fao here recently and i don't know if that's something you're familiar with and yes. if not i'll fill in the detail but yeah i am Okay, so basically that, tell us about what they're saying as far as, you know, how many harvests are left or, you know, what that looks like. Well, and it's interesting that number has popped up many times, like we have anywhere from 40 to 60 harvests left because the soil is degrading at, uh, degrading at such rapid pace. Um, and it, and see, I have, I, I appreciate the awareness of that. And, but I, one thing I've learned about being around humans, Peter, when people make statements like that, you know what the first thing humans do? They shut down. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you were making a comment. And so, you know, it hasn't seemed to get traction. Mm -hmm. Humans are interesting. We're interesting creatures. If it's mm -hmm. overwhelming where I'm not even going to start, they shut down. And I've learned that making those statements and i've done it in the past I, and i and it kind of to my embarrassment because i kind of wanted to get shocked back there you wanted to get shake people up but it actually landed up doing the, the opposite effect mm -hmm. and so i i've come to realize that and sometimes i kind of think it's also a godless narrative like there's nobody in charge it's kind of like we're just gonna fail and but let me give you an example peter uh there's been a 77 percent increase in cover crops in this country mm -hmm. since we started the soil health movement there is biology mentioned, soil biology in all the literature that in, in publications, and there's this excitement going on. And so do I espouse to that uh, 60 or 70 years of left? No, uh, yeah. I think that some major awesome things are occurring. Should we be concerned? Absolutely. I think the best analogy was um, uh, Hans Rosling gave a beautiful analogy about the, the condition of the earth it's like a little baby in icu it's in critical condition but they caught it in time it's getting better mm -hmm. and i think that's where we're at i think don't get me wrong peter i'm not naive to the fact that and i'm getting very disappointed what i see still but my gosh peter it's getting better mm -hmm. there's some awesome things occurring that i just would blow your mind we're getting that movie Kiss the Ground, have you seen that lately? Mm -hmm. It has five over 5 million views, over 10 or 12 million views on the trailer. It's exploding everywhere. Um, there's an awareness going on. Mm -hmm. And people are getting fed up with the current agriculture model. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of hope. But uh, yet it is very sobering, that statement about while well, we got 50 or 60 years, I just feel like we're going to fix it. Yeah. Well, and I tend to be an optimist. Um, I am. I am. And, I'm just and, and so, okay. Um, certainly, I've learned over the course of my life, I've seen the catastrophists 
repeatedly make their statements and repeatedly be shown yeah. to be wrong within the time frame that they specified. You know, yeah. lots of reasons for that, obviously, but it's, it's, yeah, I see one of those and I want to go, okay, wh what's that model look like that lets you reach that? I mean, where, what data were you feeding in to get, you know, still water, uh, soil erosion, whether due to wind or water is an ongoing problem. And when it's water, then it's surface water quality. Um, yeah. so I remember, um, you talking about something, you know, putting a diaper on, you know, and maybe you've moved past that kind of language. Um, and if so, I'm sorry to bring up anything, but that oh, no, was, uh, it's a good analogy because it's, uh, to tell the audience, it's like putting a buffer strip or uh, putting conservation practices that do not fix the real problem are diapers. And you're right, Peter, you remember that very well. A buffer strip are diapers. Uh, uh, and, and I always had such a problem or using the terraces. Those are all diapers because you have to deal with the, the soil the moment the raindrop falls at that spot. In other words, if you're not having living plants and building aggregates, aggregates are these fusion of sand and silts and clays done by biology, and those create pore spaces. So if you're not having a living root 24-7 intercepting the rain by building aggregates, it's a diaper. So in other words, what we're trying to convey to people, you got to cover all the soil, every bit of it. As soon as you, you harvest, cover it up. That's the way it feeds, and that's the way it creates that open skin, that porous aggregation so the water infiltrates so absolutely it's good that you remember that yeah um so within the last few years there have been a lot of discoveries related to the biological processes within the soil and mm -hmm. some compounds that are either microbial in origin or from the plant and and so let's talk rhizosphere nah. which is a word that i'm sure may be new to some so tell us what a rise what the rhizosphere is and let's start the conversation about the plant soil animal in its broadest nah. sense interaction oh good Peter. I, the rhizosphere for the audience is the root the the area of the root, it's that zone where it's, it's probably one of the most powerful zones and areas of influence. Sphere is area of influence. It's where you have, where you have roots leaking liquid sun, all these hundreds of compounds from the sun, converting light energy into chemical energy and feeding this huge array of microbiota, these soil organisms. And it's these soil organisms that release these incredible excretions into the soil. And, and, and what they do is this beautiful relationship between fungi, bacteria, and the roots. And you have this little area of influence, this zone where these compounds are leaked into the soil. So imagine this from a multidimensional perspective. These plants leak these carbon com carbon-based compounds, sugar, proteins, nucleotides, all these compounds, one, to flush and wake up these organisms, two, these, some of these acids, these compounds that leak are also acids. Gentle acids are, will help um, make phosphorus and some of those minerals soluble, but they also feed the, our, the Arbisco mycorrhizae so they can go into these tiny pores, into these caverns and bring in association with bacteria, in synergy with bacteria and fungi. And can you imagine these little fungi acting as little underground internet mm. and it's connected to that root and they're bringing water and nutrients, zinc and all these trace minerals. So you're having this multi-dimensional relationship, this mutualistic relationship where life is taking geology and, and uh, extracting the biology, extracting through excretions and life and, and these compounds and bringing this back to the mother ship. So you think about it is these plants are leaking anywhere from 30 to 70% of their energy. It takes a lot of energy to transform sun into these carbon compounds 
to bring ge geology into life. And it's these organisms that create structure, bring minerals out of the soil, and 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 also protection for disease and pathogens. There's just a there's an array and a myriad of elegance going on between these organisms and these roots. Mm. So it's I can't even begin to explain the complexity here. It's so beautiful. And it happens right there. And if that didn't, in that little sphere, if that did not occur, there would be no life on this planet, period. That's mm -hmm. how incredible that is. And in a sense, um, and I just thought of this, and maybe it doesn't work, and, but uh, a ruminant is raising up this, this, this crop of microorganisms that it then harvests, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in a sense, the plant is raising up the crop of bacteria yes. that protozoa and other organisms harvest and then make some of that nutrient available back to the plant. It's not the yes. direct kind of way as with a ruminant, but it's we're, we're still uh, uh, rearing this microbiology and harvesting it. Yes. In fact, you could that word digestion, you, there's no way that you can get that lignified material in that cellulose broken down and, and, and be able to push it into the ruminant's um, uh, bloodstream if it wasn't for the microorganism. Same thing in our gut. Same thing with that, uh, that root, or that rhizosphere and happening that mineral. Think about it. Soils without life, I tell them, if you don't have plant and microbe, you have geology, sand, mm -hmm. silt, and clay. And mm -hmm. every part of the planet has different percentages. But without that life, that microbial life, there would be no life, period. Be, you can't call it soil. And the same thing with that, yeah. that uh, the cow. There's no way the cow would be able to do what it does without those microflora. Just couldn't yeah. do it. So what's the difference between dirt and soil? Oh, huge, huge. <laughs> dirt is, I call it soil out of context. Oh, and nice, okay. By that, uh, when the moment you lift it, you disc it, and you treat it like a lifeless thing, that's dirt. The moment you say the word soil, I think of one word, life. Mm -hmm. It is plant and microbial life make soil. In fact, scientists know now that about 40% of the organic matter is dead carcasses of bacteria. Okay. So in other words, it's, these, it's the life in it that makes it the soil. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have a statement that says the plant and soil organisms are one. The plant and soil are one. You cannot separate. The moment you take that plant out, you have no microbial life. And if you take and separate it, you don't have soil. I, I think we, the way we taught soil science is a disfavor. I, mm. I, I think you cannot have soil without living plants, period. Mm. You just can't. And somebody taught me that dirt is what your mother washes out of your genes and soil is what all life depends on, right? Yeah. Um, yep. But exactly. point, you know, point taken, I mean, we can make sand culture in the greenhouse and yeah. we can do hydroponic systems and some people advocate for these in various areas, but um, clearly we've got very different. Oh, so you, you said maybe 40% of the organic matter is dead microbial origin material. But if we think about the weight of living microorganisms. I mean, I've seen various figures for how much live weight we have below and above ground in say a well-managed pasture in Missouri, for example. Um, so is there an estimate for the pounds of underground? There is, Peter. In some soils, it weighs more than a cow and calf just the living organisms could be over 2,500 pounds. And there has been estimates on a really healthy soil, it could be the weight of an elephant mm. up to 10,000 pounds. Mm. It could be huge depending on its activity. So mm. that's why I kind of, the 
this kind of you can use this statement feed the elephant mm-hmm. you know <laughs> feed the elephant well feed and let's beast. yeah let's at least talk about the elephant let's acknowledge yeah. the elephant <laughs> feed the beast. yeah 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 it could be 2500 to 10000 pounds depending on the soil yeah and I seem to remember a figure like an acre furrow slice, which would be six inches deep, and an acre, which is you yeah. know, forty three thousand square feet plus a bit. But that that is like two million pounds on average, right? Is that? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's uh, yep. That's right. Two million pounds, depending on the bulk density of it, how much sand, silt, and clay, and pore space. But it's that's a good average. Two million pounds. Yep. Yeah. So I do remember some of that traumatic experience of undergraduate school. Um, what is the substance that leads to this aggregation, this organic biological material? Biologic, that's redundant. What's the, there, there's, there's, it seems yeah, to me yeah. like a relatively recent discovery of this substance acting as a glue. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's been there's a lot of debate over this. Some people call it glomalin. I call it super molecules. And so I, I don't look. You can many scientists can get into these debates, but they're really the secretions and excretions of life and death. If you think okay. about what's going on, the microbes populate every 20 minutes in the soil. So you could have billions, and just in one tablespoon. You can have seven million bacteria. Can you imagine once you put a living plant? How many? So it's these. I call them super molecules. These a, a um, these uh, very complex biochemistry uh, rings and, and compounds that coat these particles. Some people call it Dr. Uh, White and Dr. Chris Nichols. Did the research they call it glomalin. Some people say it's a glycoprotein. Some people argue no. I just, I don't even get into the fray. I just tell them, and this is true, there's there's super biotic glues, these super substances that some scientists argue, we don't even know all the carbon chains that are interconnected with them, but they also, some of them have memory, have able to, they're dipole positive, dipole negative, they can hold into, they can hold on to water molecules. Um, They can, Hold up positive ions, negative ions. They're they're an amazing substance, but we just know they're the ones that hold the sand, silts, and clays in space and create those pores. And they last typically about twenty seven days, mm. according to Doctor Six. So they can, those glues are constantly being made and constantly being fed on. So it's kind of like your skin shedding cells and building cells and. It's dynamic living thing, you know. Mm-hmm. So this that superbiotic glues, I like to call them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there were a number of demos that you and then I've seen others do to just visually demonstrate what you were talking about, mm-hmm. and I'll find some of those links to put in the wow. notes for people to watch. One of the ones that impressed me the most was the slake test. Yeah. And and so you've already said that we need to have the soil covered um, either with residue or li- and, and preferably with a living plant in it. But part of that is to pr- protect the soil surface from the force of rain hitting it and breaking things down. But then the slake test gets to yet another aspect, which is these aggregates, the pore space, infiltration. And and all of that then gets us back to, instead of putting a diaper, you said a a filter strip or a buffer strip. Yeah, either one of diapers, if they're not. Yeah. But that's only a couple feet next to the river, right? Yeah. As opposed to the several hundred acres up the slope or whatever the, the figure uh, is. And if you could get the whole surface protected and then increase infiltration. So infiltration, tell us what that is. And then water holding and uh, and from the interaction between you already mentioned organic matter and fertility and wow. water holding but 
there's some pretty, um, to me at least, impressive estimates about how an increase in organic matter leads to an increase in our water holding capacity. And, and so if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. sure, Peter. I think that when you show the little video, I think the slate test connects all those concepts together. When I drop, when I get a very tilled soil that has been very tilled very heavily in the in same soil type and take the, a healthy soil that uses cover crops, no till, very little disturbance, manages the disturbance around you, pour them into, you pour, get both clods, really they're just heads or clods, and you drop them into the cylinder of water. What happens is water, and remember they're dry clods. I mean, there's nothing but pore space, millions of pore spaces. Water rushes in to fill the pore spaces. The soil that has been heavily tilled no longer has those biotic glues, those biotic substances that and that really formulates the uh, the pore space, holding the sands and silts in place. They also have those dipole molecules that actually increases water holding capacity. Those glues are gone. They've been consumed by our strategies bacteria. So when you till the soil, you eat. In essence, people call it organic matter. I don't like to call it that. I call it super molecules. The organisms eat it. They're called R strategies. They're kind of like a protective mechanism. So when you till the soil, the soil saying, "Oh my God, I'm, uh, there's uh, an alert comes on," and they, these microbes start to consume the biotic glues, release, they die, and they release nitrate into the soil, and then awaken the weeds. It's kind of like. Uh, like the white blood cells of the soil, uh, of the human body is like, oh, there's a there's there's something wrong, and so in the healthy soil, when you do do very little disturbances, that those superbiotic glues are caked in, and so they still hold their integrity in that soil. Those biotic glues not only increase integrity in the soil and structure, but the pores are open, and you have the water holding capacity and the ability to hold those nutrients in. So the, the soil that falls apart no longer has that ability. And then when you see the, the column being filled with little particulates of clay and silt, they're actually plugging up the pores. And so that's why when you have, it rains, the water runs off because the pore spaces of the clays, because clays are so tiny, you got to see them in an electric, electron microscope, they fill up the pores. So all those things are intimately related and connected because keep in mind, 1% organic matter is equivalent to about 22,000 more gallons of water holding capacity per acre. And one acre inch is 27,154 gallons. In an acre, 43,560 feed, uh, square feet, 1% organic matter, I can hold close to 20 to 22,000 more gallons of water. And that's amazing. So if you build your organic 2 or 3%, you're talking 50, 60,000 more gallons you can hold in an acre. It's pretty significant. A lot of the people who have been listening are people who are coming from the human nutrition metabolic health communities that I've been introduced to. And so... Um, they, many of them are eating animal source food and maybe a lot of ruminant animal source food. And so they'll hear people say, but if you, you know, that somehow the production of animal source food inherently is destructive. And yet, there's this reality of if we are producing animal source food, ruminant animal systems based on grasslands that are managed appropriately, then we've got a whole different dynamic in the soil and in those areas that that's taking place in compared to people that are existing on a diet that is primarily commodity crop based for just to leave it at its most general. So how much of how much of the soil health and the um, more 
ecological approaches are dependent on the inclusion of ruminant animals into the system at some point. Right. Uh, it's, it, it's huge, Peter. Look, back in the 30s, the Russian soil microbiologists knew that these, I, I think they were so far, far, further ahead than our American counterparts. They knew back then that that there's molecules, like if you applied manure to a plant and, and to wheat, for example, that manure and even it increase a little bit of mineral nitrogen would enhance the B vitamin concentration on the seed head. Uh, if you read uh, a lot of, uh, well, just recently, a great publication was by, um, uh, our, our friend that wrote Nourishment. Uh, Fred Provenza. Fred Provenza, mm -hmm. Fred Provenza. If you read through his book and his literature and the searches, it was, it's these secondary tertiary molecules that we know through the natural system uh, have, are passed from organism to organism. And when the cow picks up the different, uh, that's why diversity, diverse paddocks are so incredibly important because if you watch a, a, a sheep or a cow graze, it's amazing. Sometimes you actually think there's kind of this randomness going on, but there's their sensory perception going on and they're picking up these plants. And I've seen them, some of them just go out there and just all of a sudden grab a bite on my cedar tree. And they're picking up these compounds. And the bottom line is there's no possible way that any human could ever make a complete ration for an animal that would enhance the total dynamic, the, bring you the total dynamics of all those photonutrients. So much we focused on these micronutrients, inorganic nutrients, but it's these carbon-based molecules those, that our bodies take are absolutely incredibly important. We're carbon-based, right? Yes, and you're exactly right. We're a carbon-based organism. 60% of it is made of carbon. But those microflora, having those different molecules in our small intestine, being able to pass that really thin layer about a cell thickness, and it goes into our, our, our bloodstream, it is incredibly critical. There is no possible way that you could even compare a grass-fed animal to a, an animal that is in the industrial fed prescriptive diet to ever match what the good creator did. It's just impossible. And, and, and to even think that even close is, is just a lack of understanding in the, and lacking the right approach of how you look at the natural system. Keep in mind, I, Peter, I used to design the nutrient plants for those large industrial complexes. I didn't even begin to understand how we were missing the mark. So, and, and there's literature all over, you a little here, a little there, reaffirming what you and I are talking about. How, how Have you been doing work in what I've been introduced to as the livestock cropping systems or, and even the silvo pastoral cropping mm -hmm. systems. Is that been a part of what you're working on? Um, or, Cause I. Yeah, we have, uh, we like for myself here in Missouri, in my, in my farm, I got 70 acres of woods and then I'm going to go in there, do a little bit of select cutting and start planting these various species so that I have this civil pasture approach where you have these, my animals can go from the pasture into my silver pastures. And then I can move them back and forth. And I would love to put a warm seasons in that. And then my cool seasons in, in the open areas because I have predominant fescue, but, and by the moving of my animals, I would encourage more diversity. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so we're working on that. And also we're doing what you call pasture cropping, where you come in with a no-till drill and plant annuals so if you have a cool season grass, you come with a warm season annual and you plant right into it 
and those warm seasons pop right up and then you let the cows graze that. So we use this kind of a bridge. So like when we have our slump, uh, our times when our cool seasons begin to slump off and just become to diminish in yield and productivity because our cool season that's getting hotter, we come in with salt, warm season mixes and then increase the biomass and then bring in these different types of molecules and compounds into the mm. feeding the animals. You had a bit of a drought this late, late summer, didn't you, fall? Oh, yeah. You're very, man, Peter, nothing, I think nothing uh, passes you. Yeah, we were in a very, very bad drought. We we typically get 46 inches of rain here, but we were hurting. I'm telling you, we, I think I got like one or one or two inches the whole summer. And that was critical for us because uh, that's kind of the carryover that will take us into the fall so that we can graze all the way into like this uh, January and February because where we're at, we're, we're, we're pretty warm. So we can graze all the way. If you did things right here, you could probably get away without feeding hay. And, but that drought just absolutely killed that and diminished that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of a lot of seed didn't get planted this fall. Um, yeah, no. No. In, unless you hit it just exactly right, and then you couldn't have gotten it all planted. So, even if you hit the timing right for a little bit of it, um, uh, well, that's why they call it agriculture and not manufacturing, right? You don't. Um, <laughs> so you can't control all your operating parameters. Um, so you've since you left well for, congratulations on retirement um no, you know i'm kind of looking that way myself um but now you're involved how you have a, a is it right to call it a business or a consultancy or an educational well, um well it's both i think uh um as you know peter uh gabe brown Alan, dr alan williams and uh, shane new we're the founders of Soil Health Academy and, and, and David Brandt. We founded uh, Soil Health Academy, which is a nonprofit, because to be honest, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't like what was coming out of the universities. Uh, we wanted more ecologically focused teaching, and we wanted to create a program where kind of a mentorship program where we can help farmers and ranchers and anybody that wants to learn about agriculture, about how to do more biomimicry, how to mimic nature, how to use agroecology, how to, how to use the innate wisdom of intelligent design and how to teach the producers how to get off these chemical inputs. And, and so we did that. And then understanding ag is the, the uh, consulting branch, the consulting arm is kind of a two-pronged approach. It's kind of the academic. And then the, the consulting aspect is understanding ag where for profit, it's where we go and help a producer take him from step one to whatever, to uh, hand, kind of hand-holding um, journey to get him away from the inputs. And once they, we feel that they, they have that understanding, then we just kind of let ourselves go and they don't need us anymore. So it's really two pronged ones, kind of more from an academic hands-on school. And then the other one is kind of a mentorship program. I mean, teaching and mentoring and helping the producer get off chemicals yeah so you you mentioned uh, earlier um about how if it's too big a crisis if it's too big an issue we just kind of shut down we ignore it we um there's sort of something like it which is about our resistance to change yeah. Um, and and I've I've heard people say there is no pain in change. There is, however, a tremendous amount of pain with associated with the resistance to change, right? It, 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 so we have these clues, we have these potential epiphanies, but if we keep ignoring them, then the cost of ignoring them keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Right. And yeah. so how? I, I know that farming communities, I heard it's somebody said, you, you farm on a billboard. Everybody watches what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows what's going on. And they're all ready to judge before it works or doesn't work or what have you. So um, 
are you um, aware of something that I've seen like grazing groups where groups of grass farmers kind of come together to support each other and share information and tell each other what's going on and get answers? Are there are there those kinds of things for producers and what role do you see understanding ag playing in that? And then also for people who aren't in agriculture, where they can go to learn more and become more aware of what we would both argue is a really fundamental issue. Right. Well, I think, Peter, I think that's one of the major reasons why we have such a big problem. Um, it's social conditioning. Social conditioning is brutal. It, there's, a, there's a reason why the analogy that Christ uses that humans as sheep. If you ever deal with sheep and you've done it, Peter, you watch how if one sheep is isolated, it'll kill itself just to get to the other group. And um, the, the social conditioning in the local community is absolutely brutal. Being part of the Soil Health Academy, coming to our schools and going to understanding ag, it's kind of you, you start to build this community of like thinking people. I tell producers, don't do this on your own build community with people that are like-minded people and only bring them. That's why the Australians have gone so far ahead because they don't have cash here. They don't have government programs. They just have community. And if you're not part of a community that you have two, three, four people that you held accountable to, there is no way. It, it just makes it very, very difficult for you to uh, propel yourself quickly. Let me give an example. If you have 10 producers that H1 decides to do a research project every year, a demonstration, and you share it with a group of 10, you've just propelled the learning 10 times. And you've increased uh, and reduced that by a factor of 10 because you will spend the rest of your life doing this by yourself. And we as Americans are very individualistic. And I, I, I'm telling us it hurts us. We should be more community-based. And the community is powerful, but it all comes back again to that social conditioning. And until one group, one person gets a paradigm shift that, that breaks that hard surface between the years, then he gets so excited and becomes, and there's a leader, then it attracts to this nucleus of community. And then you start getting this whole group to change. But the dynamics of social conditioning is brutal. And it's not just in the farming. If you work in academia, if you work for USDA, if you do not follow the mantra of the group, you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think you understand that, Peter. And I, I think it's in every corporate America, it's in every group, it, it, there's a social condition that occurs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, it's not unique to agriculture, um, no, no. but but it is a reality in agriculture. And it, it's it, you. So it's interesting to hear, um, because I do think exactly what you said, if you could have 10 people each doing their own experiment, nobody can do 10 experiments. No. But if you everybody is open and sharing with that information, um, then you can make some progress. So that's uh, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, we've been really f struggling with the technology, and I apologize for that. Thank you for oh, taking no, no. the time. Um, I've asked you a bunch of questions. Um, it's fair to ask me uh, any that you might have, or, or perhaps I could find a few more to ask you. Well, Peter, I, what I, I, I think you've been involved in livestock for quite a long time, and you're an academic. What changed you to think this way? Because I'm gonna be honest with you, I've been around a lot of academics, and, and one of the most difficult things I've seen sometimes can be the most inhibiting thing is um and it's for all humans we can get into this mode of the intellectual arrogance that we think we know everything and i find out through my experience that humility is the best conduit for knowledge to flow 
in your situation in academia, uh, and you've been around all over the country, Peter, you've been exposed to a lot of people. Um, what do you think the hangup is? Because I'm going to tell you one of the biggest struggles we've had is academia. Mm. I mean, we've had the biggest struggles for academia and, uh, to shift into a system that just absolutely makes a lot of sense. What, what do you think that occurs in your opinion? Well, so the, it, it started, you started the question on me and, me, yeah. and, and then we can get to the institutions. Yeah. I think for me, one of the things that benefited me was fairly early on, I got interested in forage systems, which required at least some thought mm -hmm. outside of just crop science or just animal science. And so that kind of got me thinking along those lines. Number two is that I've had my own personal experiences outside of my disciplines that forced me to reevaluate some fundamental assumptions. And so you, and, and, and part of that reevaluation was a realization that we've been told some things along the way that when you step outside of your area of expertise and start digging into that one, you go, what? <laughs> You've been telling us this based on that? That's your evidence? So that kind of an approach has led me to be, in my better moments, more open to possibilities and looking at things. And then again, I'm now becoming very interested in how you know, globally sustainable food systems, right? All of humanity uh, being fed appropriately. So all of that is how I got here. In terms of the institutions, I want to find somebody that can help me with the history of those institutions from World War II on. Because I, I see you had this, you know, millions of primarily young men left the farm, right? It was, it were still in this transition. Uh, certainly it was well underway by World War II, but we, we were transitioning from a rural to an urban suburban, which globally we're doing, by the way. Um, you know, by 2050, it's estimated that like 80% of the world's population will be in urban suburban areas. Mm. So, we're already there. Um, you know, the, the rest of the world is, is, is on that trajectory for good, bad, or otherwise. And so now these people, at the end of the war, they come back. They're not going back to the farm, a lot of them, for a number of reasons. They have the opportunity to go to university to get trained to do any number of wit, uh, uh, things. And one of the big things that they did was they got trained in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And you you had a different um, employee base, workforce after the war. Labor costs went up to the farmer that fed the technology kind of, you know, circularly fed on each other for both of those reasons. Um, and And you built these big institutions, big footprints, and then the funding went away right and and so i i remember one professor full full professor he was close to being emeritus at the time i was hired and i remember in the lunchroom he was saying you know um we couldn't hire a brand new phd for the salary they're paying me that, that's what he was saying as a full tenured professor you know Mm -hmm. and, and hiring a new, and, and so the resources shifted societally, they changed. Okay, so now if you're going to be in those institutions and do work to be successful, you've got to chase the money. So where's the money? Where's that coming from? The, the research drives, and it's interesting, actually, um, President Eisenhower in his farewell address that everybody thinks of warning about the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. He also warned about the government research complex. Really? And the danger of 
this kind of work being funded by the government and what that, so he was really prescient in a lot of areas, but um, so, so you, you have that, I'll give you one example and I don't do it to cast aspersions. Um, a, a good friend of mine ended up in administration and he and I talk and I'm, um, you might not be surprised, but I talked to him about diet, right? That's kind of a big thing for me. And um, so I'm talking about what extension could do to promote this message, right? We have a, a diabetes epidemic, an obesity epidemic. He's in the southeastern U.S. That's the diabetes city belt. What's extension doing to serve that? And what do I, what, what, well, okay. USDA provides a great deal of funding to extension to convey their dietary recommendations. And what he, my friend said to me is, okay, you want me to put half my faculty's salary at risk. As an administrator, he was thinking this, right? So, that's that's when you're going against what the official policy or positions are. And then you have the other, somebody calls it generational learning, right? This is what my major professor taught me. He was taught by his major professor. I Maybe now I have graduate students, who knows? But, you know, so this just continues. And now if I'm going to change, I'm putting my sort of academic social relationships at risk, right? Because I may piss off my major professor. And, you know, if I'm a graduate student and I'm going to go out and make my, you know, part of that is on my major professor's reputation. So, you know, there, there's all of these impediments to the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake and, and, and then distributing that. Um, Again, you said it before, it's human nature at various levels operate. And then there's the institutional nature operating at various levels. But I, I can well imagine, I know from one experience that we went, a, a colleague and I went to the administration at a university and said, you know, we made the case for um, why they might want to implement this course that we were suggesting and we got a really good response from the director from his associate directors and when it got back to the faculty in their departments it got hammered like you're not going to do that no ain't no but hell no was we got back very politely worded from one of them so um i can imagine i've experienced a little bit of it um one thing that I believe at this point, again, back to, I want to be an optimist. I think that a lot of these messages, if we can get enough support for them, ground up, you know, grassroots, so to speak, um, that might actually force things to happen. Um, but I, that feels like I'm being overly optimistic at that point. And, it, and to be honest, Peter, it, that is occurring in <laughs> certain universities, you know, universities of agroecology are teaching that. So you're right. It is occurring. It's slow. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I think you did a beautiful way of explaining generational from this is what my professor taught. That's a huge issue. And follow the money. I think you're you're correct. I, I think we've seen that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of been a big delay for us to embrace that. And um, and the third one is just playing human nature. And, and can you imagine having to say that you're wrong? Oh, yeah. I've had to say that. I've yeah. had to say that I taught wrong. I gave bad information. Didn't mean to. Right, but, right, right. And it's well, okay. I, yeah. So what is it? If an honest man is shown to be an error, he either ceases to be an error or he ceases to be honest. Right. So we'll, we'll figure it out here at some point. Um, I, one, one of the most powerful pieces of video I've seen, there's a professor from South Africa by the name of Tim Noakes. 
and he was very big in the whole running endurance athletes carb loading he wrote a significant book in the field talked about it there's video of him because in his 50s or 60s he developed even though he was still active he was still lean he developed type 2 diabetes that forced him into the literature that got him into therapeutic carbohydrate reduction ketogenic diets he looked at it okay he's convinced he changed so now He's sitting in his office. He says, I wrote this book. And he reaches in and he grabs a section and he pulls out it and he goes, I no longer believe this bit. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, okay. Um, we can all be wrong. What happens when we get the opportunity to see that we're wrong? Then what? That That's the, and like you say, it's, it's really hard for human beings to say I was wrong. <laughs> so. Our, you can you can listen to the politics. Nobody wants to be wrong. They just want to be in control and in charge. And it takes a lot of. I've seen some of the things I've learned about the regenerative producers is that that humility factor and and willing to change. So that's important. And and just in some in some cases, the patience, right to. We, we want what we want when we wanted it, which was yesterday, right? We, we don't, and, and some of these things are going to take time. Yeah. Um, also, uh, we, we might talk about um, one of my, I've said, I have a menagerie of pet peeves. You know, I've got lots of them. Um, quite a collection by this point. And part of it is that American, we've been using really poor metrics of human health. Yes. Really bad metrics. No. What are some metrics of soil health? Are there One of them is the current old soil test is a poor matrix. Hmm. The, um, there was a statement that you made that I, I and I may say it different, uh, coming back to models. What model did you use to push that data in? I have this new statement. Remember the statement, Peter? All models are wrong. Some are useful. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to weather and dynamic systems. Erosion model is way off. Soil test. All soil tests are wrong. Some are useful. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? There is no test in the world that will ever model the dynamics and the elegance of the soil. And, and I think we need to get that in our mind. When I think of as a, pra a practitioner, like an agronomist, more, and, and you take it in the field of a medical doctor and yourself, like when you've seen animals or whatever, I want to use every tool to my dispose to find indicators of health. When a doctor uses the blood sample, it can tell you hormonal function. It can tell you pH. It can tell you um, all kinds of things about your body. That's the one indicator, the MRI, urine sample, fecal sample. All of these are indicators of health to a very elegant, complex ecosystem, the human being. Well, the soil's the same way. The soil test that we have measures organic matter and inorganic nutrients very, very poor. One, the acids, the the because um, it was based on the wrong premise. It wasn't based on the fact that a soil was a elegant ecosystem. Two, it was based a lot on heavy chemistry by Liebig and then they, they approached the soil from a, from a chemistry perspective. Um, the third thing of that is that the soils were already destroyed by the time they started sampling, when they started collecting their data and that, they were so degraded and they were calibrating their soils to a very degraded system already. Mm -hmm. And, they, and so when you did nitrogen prediction, when you took a soil sample and you, when you measured a forest for nitrogen and a pasture or a conventional soil, it was like, hold on a second. If I took a soil sample in the forest, there's no nitrogen, hardly, hardly any, or even in a prairie or a forest. I said, hold on a second. How come there's all this biomass? Where's the nitrogen coming from? And so the, the tests, and, we, and to be fair, we didn't have the equipment. We didn't have the equipment. 
um, and the wrong premise. We came with wrong results and the wrong test. And so now, like using the Haney test, using phospholipid fatty acid test, using all these other soil tests, and I still use the old soil test for some parameters like cation exchange capacity. You know, even though as weak as it is, I can use certain things, a shovel, a smell, sniff test, go out there. It's kind of like, Peter, now I look at the soil as a whole and use all these indicators to tell me how the soil, infiltration test, lake test, all these parameters, indicators, now give me a better picture of what I'm dealing with. Um, and that's how uh, the whole approach was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, and you have to understand that. If you don't understand that, and that's what happens with a lot of people when they misinterpret the Haney test, they're trying to come from a chemical paradigm and using that test, and they're thinking that test replaces the old test. I say, no, apples and oranges. Don't even compare them. Use them together as a collective, but use all these tests to give you a bigger picture. So our indicators were way off. And so that was one of them that I just had such a pet peeve about using the old soil test. It's just, it's just you're asking wrong questions. Mm. And the science was based on the wrong premise. So um, be careful how you use your, your tools. Mm. Well, indeed, um, anyone who's ever hit themselves with a hammer, um, <laughs> that, that might be another version of that lesson. That's a useful tool, Absolutely. but, um, okay. Ray, I, again, apologize for the, the lesson. Oh, no, no, uh, it's great to touch base with you. And I look forward to the next time that we can do anything together and, um, or I can sit in the audience and learn from you. And I ran into Gabe Brown up at, uh, um, oh, that was a year, two years ago next month up in um, Alberta. Actually, it was in Edmonton. Yeah. Uh, the, oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it's just always a great time to visit Edmonton in February. Um. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, yeah. I did, a, I, I did a talk up there in Edmonton, but the Canadian people are worth it. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I thought I'd seen the prairie until I got in Saskatchewan and Alberta. And then it was like, oh my goodness. Um, well, last thought I want to leave to the audience, Peter, is that, you know, diversity of organisms, I, you know, the more and more I think about diversity, the power of diversity, and one of the principles is diversity of organisms and plants is the transfer of energy nutrients, uh, photonutrients from organism to organism to organism. If it wasn't for diverse organisms doing their function, we would have a lifeless planet. Mm. And so diversity of plants leads to diversity of photonutrients and, and, and richness in our bodies. So in, in the way, the more diverse we eat and the better we eat, and the more we take care of, I think it's just, really adds to our health so i really appreciate what you do peter and, and and bringing awareness to people about connecting um soil health from from a healthy soil to a healthy plant healthy animal healthy human healthy climate the it's so it's so simple and so elegant and the moment that any of that the connectivity that connectedness gets broken you diminish it diminished the whole. So uh, thank you for bringing awareness for that. That's really important. And, and thank you for all you've been doing and you continue to do and good luck in Missouri. Thank you, Peter. You have a good one and I'm going to go enjoy my, my meal. And uh, I got to go to New Mexico. So go visit my parents. So thank you, Peter. If you come anytime you come to Missouri, come and visit the farm. Thank you very much. I'll take you up on it. Mm. And we'll feed you some lamb. How's that? Excellent. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, happy to do that thank you <laughs> and, gra and grass fed by the way well you know it's fermented plant product it's <laughs> very good thank you peter bye-bye